start recording. I forgot that. Cool. So what is the venture? Uh, we at the venture, we follow uh, a vision and that vision is to become the leading partner for a new generation of innovators who responsively execute solutions that make a positive contribution to society. So we see ourselves as the partner on this ever evolving journey of innovation, um, especially for this new generation of innovators who have a responsible mindset, but also want to execute. So we're not the people who uh, purely make nice PowerPoints. We make nice PowerPoints and we execute. And you will see this uh, later on that there's a lot of execution focus that we have. And we do this execution always with this positive contribution to society in mind, which is uh, super important to us. Uh, we have the pleasure over the last five years to work with some amazing innovators, uh, the new generation of innovators. Um, and this is basically from startups that just merely started, no one knows their logo, to like the big players who actually know, everyone should know their logos. And it's, it's always a privilege and an honor that companies like those trust us on their journey and uh, we can empower them with execution to bring society forward. How do we do this? Well, coming from the vision, let's get a little bit more concrete. What we actually do is we offer uh, services in innovation coaching, growth marketing, software development, and data engineering. This is the part that we're going to talk uh, mostly today. And we do this again for startups and established companies on the whole journey. So we cover idea generation all the way to building a minimal viable product, to scaling it to a first version, to then a global impact afterwards. So all the way um, from ideation to global impact. <clears throat> Good. Now that we got the venture out of the way and you guys know where we're coming from and uh, where we basically sit, uh, let's start with actually going into um, what AI actually means and how to set up a proper AI project. And it already starts with the word AI because AI is such a fuzzy term and there's been a lot of like different ways of trying to standardize it, finding a different meaning, um, narrowing the, the actual concept down. And the closest we actually have to an official definition of what AI is, I printed on the next slide, is actually coming from the European Commission. Uh, they have a high level expert group that actually looks at that topic and they define AI in the following way. Artificial intelligence systems are software system designed uh, by humans that, and now it, comes, now it becomes interesting, given a complex goal, so here we have the first requirement, act in a physical or digital dimension by perceiving their environment through data acquisition, interpreting the collected structured or unstructured data, reasoning on the knowledge or processing the information derived from this data, and deciding the best actions to take to achieve the given goal. AI systems can either use symbolic rules or learn a uh, numerical model, and they can also adapt their behavior by analyzing how the environment is affected by their previous actions. So there's a lot to unpack here. So first of all, we always need a complex goal. A simple goal, according to the definition, doesn't cut it. It needs to be complex. We need some capabilities to act in a physical or a digital dimension. We need to perceive the environment that we're actually in through data acquisition. So we need to have some form of sensory data or some form of data scraping or data awareness. Uh, we need to interpret uh, the collected structure and unstructured data. We need to reason on the knowledge or at least process the information. And then we need to derive uh, some actions or choose the best actual action um, to, to get us closer uh, to this goal. And I think this already gives some perspective that a lot of the projects we see nowadays out there that frame themselves as AI uh, that they actually fall through and uh, there might be like smarter big data analytics projects <clears throat> or that um, they are actually like closer to a statistical analysis out there. So now that we roughly know like what the definition of AI might occur, 
let's have a little bit of um, uh, a deeper look at what counts as an AI project, right? So in reality, uh, what we see out there in the market, everything that is close to smart is nowadays branded as an AI project, um, which is really surprising because obviously the term AI has such a big attraction that everyone's jumping on it. So why is that, why is that problematic? Why, why is that um, actually not um, adventurous or why is it not beneficial in the real world out there? So first of all, given the term AI, you already have really high expectations. Just saying you are an AI project generally with the stakeholders involved in your project sets the bar really up here and you'll always try to like uh, get behind that expectations and try to tackle it. Second of all, in AI, in really core AI projects, the outcome often looks like nothing. And it is only visible what you're actually doing if you look at the numbers. And if you, for example, look into performance optimization, or if you look into the, the nitty gritty details of the um, analysis, that you actually find, oh, you are actually doing this, you're improving this by 10, 15, 20%. But on the outside, it looks like nothing. My favorite example, and everyone that knows me knows that example, is, is a chatbot. Because on the outside, it looks like nothing. It looks like an input box and you can write stuff in there and you get a message back. But considering everything that needs to happen to understand, uh, to, to read the context, uh, to query stuff on the internal interface, there's so much hidden from the user that it's actually um, really amazing that it looks like nothing. Without a baseline process, uh, progress is often hard to spot. So this is, uh, a micro learning in there, whenever you do an AI project, take a baseline of what you actually find in the company when you go in there, because without this baseline, it is so incredibly hard to argue, like what have you actually achieved? Where, where are you starting from? So micro advice, take the time, take that baseline, and then it's way easier to argue from there uh, what the actual outcome of the, um, of the project is. AI projects are cool, but too many cooks spoil the broth. So this is something that actually will, will lead to the first major learnings that uh, we had uh, in, uh, in all our projects is that learning one, uh, stakeholder management is key. So this is, this is really before you even start, get everyone on board. Uh, before you even start, get the expectations right, uh, measure your baseline, and uh, basically keep all the stake, uh, stakeholder management and their expectation in check. If you don't do this, you already failed uh, to some extent and you'll have struggles afterwards because uh, there is, and believe it or not, always high expectations to AI projects and this needs to be managed properly. Okay, so uh, going forth, uh, now that we have the first major learning, um, let's move on to another thing. So we have expectations, we have this key stakeholders, uh, shareholders managed. What are actually the success criteria for putting in an AI project that um, is likely to work best and that um, can actually succeed? And we found that there are just two criteria, And this is amazing because um, these projects tend to be super complex, but um, narrowing it down to those two, uh, I think makes the most sense. So you'll have a good time in an AI project if you have one, a high volume of data, and two, a high frequency of data. So high volume of data means there's lots of data available that the AI can learn from. And high frequency, that this data occurs very, very frequently. If you have both criteria, then you're really gonna have a good time in your AI project because there's massive learnings the AI can draw from and can learn from. If you have one of two, it normally, it's gonna be a little tricky. Uh, but you need at least one of those two to actually uh, make it happen. Again, having both is, is the ideal case uh, to going forward. Okay, so we have 
found the right environment for our project, we know that this is a good way to start a project, then what is the best way to actually set up the project? So the way we do it, and we think obviously this is a, is a good idea to set it up, is to have uh, basically a round table in the middle. On the one side, there is um, the company that we partner with, uh, they have their internal stakeholders and they kind of nominate a project owner on their side that is the, the communication interface to us. And on our side, we have the Deventry team and we nominate a, a project manager uh, and that project manager is kind of like from our side, the face uh, to, the, to the project. And then there's a clear split in responsibilities and what people are actually supposed to do uh, in, in the project. And we, for example, we work in two week sprints. So everything you see here is uh, very much focused on, on the sprint structure. So the project owner creates the work items, approves the sprint scope, reviews uh, with us together the work that has been done. And on our team side, we actually do the heavy lifting. We secure the quality, we secure the timeline, secure the budget. We report each sprint what has been done. And this is very important. We often provide an outside view of what else could be done and what else do we see from our experience that actually would help the project. And then the magic obviously coming uh, those two together where actually in the middle the meeting happens and we plan the sprint, we communicate the process, uh, we empower the stakeholders through the project owner, through the project manager, we mitigate interests and we review the process that has happened in the last uh, two weeks. So learning number two, by failing to prepare properly, you are preparing to fail. So um, take the homework, set up the project correctly, split clear responsibilities, uh, educate everyone involved, what are their responsibilities, because then you can actually smoothly, um, smoothly bring this in into uh, a proper cycle where you have all the organizational aspects in there and you are not uh, preparing to fail, but you're properly uh, prepared for the actual um, project to come. Okay, already two learnings in, let's uh, look even further. So now that we have a project and now we, we know what to do, let's look a little bit at the expectations that we have normally when uh, going into the project. So what most people actually believe how an AI project will work is that there are some planning involved. Planning will be quick because we obviously know what to do and we know what, uh, what we actually want to achieve. Then we have this huge phase where we implement something that will make the magic happen. And then we know at the end, because we heard about it already, that an AI needs training. And yes, we have put some training in there. Uh, we know this is going to happen, but at the end, the project is going to be fine. We can uh, put, on, um, put on a switch and then the AI does its magic and we suddenly see how it works. As, as, you, have, as you might have noticed from my, from my subtone, this actually never happens that way. Actually, in reality, it uh, more often looks like this. You have some planning, which actually takes a really, really long time. It takes a long time to getting all the data, cleaning the data, the data is in different formats, in different variations in different silos. You have to get it out. You have to clean it. There's, uh, there's um, spots in there. There's like all kinds of weird stuff in formatting. So planning really takes a long time. So most of the time people are like really surprised how long it takes. But then implementation to the first version actually happens really, really fast. And this is normally the time where everyone's like, oh, wow, cool, we're already here. We're actually making up time, so this is cool. And uh, building an AI is often like very simple. Uh, there's a lot of pre-built stuff out there that you can reuse. <clears throat> and generally speaking, it's not that complicated. And then we train it. Okay, training takes some time, but uh, this is not, uh, not the biggest part. Very often you have to 
in the training, rework a little bit. That's why uh, this is also a time blocker. And then we switch it on. We get the first results, and they're not good. So um, this is very often that happens that after the first training iteration, um, we are not seeing the great major super cool results that we're hoped for and that we sold our stakeholders. So this is a very critical phase now in the project because if you, if you throw the towel into the ring now, then you have wasted a lot of energy uh, and potentially money um, and you're not getting the outcome. Instead, what is a better way is to actually get more data, implement maybe a little bit in the algorithm, tweak it, find a different architecture, do retraining, and then try again. And with more data, normally you see a little bit better results. Still not sunny, there's still like some clouds. Um, it's not really working, but now you guessed it. If you repeat this, maybe add additional sources, then after like the, the second iteration, uh, it normally looks way better. Obviously, this is not a given. At any of those moments, you can fail with the project, having not enough data, don't having significant data, not having the significant sources, don't finding the, uh, the actual feature, and then you need to go back to the drawing board. So this is always something that can happen. Obviously, success isn't guaranteed. And um, yeah, in that regard, uh, you can always fall back to the actual drawing board. So learning out of this, AI projects are mostly explorative. You try really trying to find the features that get to your behavior, and you're kind of trying to iterate through this. So the build, measure, learn, repeat mantra that we have in the company really, really needs to be followed here. And you really need to like kind of incorporate at least a couple of iterations to really know if this is working or not. Throwing more data at it sometimes helps. Uh, getting additional sources in there always uh, sometimes helps, not always helps, sometimes helps. And hopefully it gets you there, but this is always the project risk. Good, moving on. There is a topic that now that we have our AI algorithm and now that it kind of produces already working results uh, is a topic that everyone now talks about and that I think uh, is super interesting to look at is bias. Bias in AI is kind of the big topic that everyone covers from the New York Times to Wired Magazine to Harvard Business Review. McKinsey has a good article on it. Um, so everyone's talking about AI and everyone's trying to like really prohibit their AI from having a bias. So uh, bias is uh, according to the media, a really bad thing and we should try to prevent it under any circumstances. And it actually makes sense if you look at uh, a very famous example that is out there. And the example is Amazon. So Amazon actually uh, had a very smart idea. Uh, and the idea was they have a lot of CVs of people who apply every year to Amazon. And they said, okay, we have the data of the CV of the people applying. And we actually know the outcome of that decision uh, meaning we hired the person or we didn't hire the person. So we have actually the perfect training set. We can actually very perfectly say, okay, if this CV comes in, this is a, a very high likelihood of hiring this person, or if this CV comes in, it's a very low likelihood of hiring this person. So they used historical CVs and the hiring decisions to actually train an AI. And tech shops, historically speaking, have two view uh, woman, sorry. And you can see this actually, this is a nice graphic from Reuters that it's not even like close to 50%. It is actually more like 80% male in, in some of the uh, criteria in big tech companies. So what do we expect? Right, the AI learned to prefer men over women because the historical data clearly suggested that if you're a man, you have a higher likelihood to be hired by Amazon. And uh, this is obviously a really bad trade that the AI 
learned? Or is it? Because it is in the data. And this is actually where the interesting conflict comes in. Because the AI is right in a sense that the data suggests that there is a bigger likelihood for man to be hired. But the underlying issue is that we as a society are very much opposed to this shift in the data and we're very much supposed to the historical tradition that this data suggests. So what's the middle thing here? And obviously now media suggests that you wanna get rid of all the biases in your data. You wanna get rid of all the things that uh, tears the, this, um, the data into one or another direction. But the truth is, an AI model without any bias is useless because it can't predict anything. Prediction comes from the fact that there is something in the data that the AI can learn as a pattern and say, oh, if this and this and this is in the data, then I can make a decision. So if you get rid of all the biases, then it's pretty useless to predict anything because you're getting a white uh, a white output that doesn't matter. So uh, interestingly, um, the answer to the problem with bias actually comes from William Shakespeare's Hamlet that actually quotes, um, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So this actually means we have to actually think of if we want the criteria to be part of our AI, if this is socially accepted, if this bias is a good bias that we can use as a feature, or is it a bad bias that actually may cause uh, a social backlash or really, really bad PR? So the big question is, what is fair in my AI application? And have I considered all the aspects that fairness means in my application. And the bad news is this is probably a fully individual assessment per project because it is really individual what the project actually does, what the project actually should do, what data comes in, what data is available, what should I take into consideration, what's my social environment, what's my uh, country that I'm in, what kind of data of, of which citizens do I process? So this is fully individual. Thank God uh, the European Union, because the European Union actually has um, an answer to what is fair, or at least how can you get closer to fairness, let's say it that way. And this is the ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI that I can wholeheartedly recommend to anyone who does an AI project, uh, because it was uh, actually published as a second draft by the high-level expert group of the European Commission. And it actually states seven very detailed in the report ideas and questions on how to assess your AI project and at what parts to look at. So obviously this is not yet in any way a binding governmental um, regulation or, or anything like that, but it is kind of like a view of an expert group that um, are some amazing people. And I think uh, they have done an incredible good work looking at all the different aspects. Maybe one day in the not too far future, this might lead to some uh, European regulations. Uh, at least this would be the roadway at uh, the roadmap for the high level expert group. So yeah, if you want to be future-proof, I think this is totally worth um, taking into consideration because the European Commission actually asked for this report and uh, already said in a statement that they're likely to put some legal action onto this. So let's have a look at the seven, uh, seven criteria. So the first one is uh, human agency and oversights. Those are all the fundamental human rights um, and their trade-offs uh, that uh, we normally are used to in the European Union. Then technical robustness and safety. This is all from security to data leaks, to separation of concerns, um, all the way down to uptime availability, et cetera. Privacy and data governance. Uh, governance. 
this is obviously uh, data and everything that has to do with sharing uh, personal data and exchanging personal data and uh, securing data at rest and uh, data in movement. Uh, transparency, um, this really clearly states what needs to be published, what people need to make aware of, um, and how can you, can you basically look at the transparency and the system itself. Diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness. Um, this looks at all the different dimensions of diversity um, and how to best establish uh, a non-discrimination uh, gender in there. Societal and environmental well-being, which I'm really happy that this section is in there because we as uh, companies can only operate in an environment around us that is healthy. So we should also take care of the surroundings of our own uh, company. So this is all questions uh, regarding the impact on the society, on the impact of the environment um, that the algorithm has. And uh, I think this, um, this could be also like a really interesting consideration especially because training an AI algorithm might take considerable uh, calculation power in uh, uh, calculation power in a data center. So there is an environmental well-being effect that needs to be taken into consideration. And uh, last but not least, accountability, meaning what actually is it that um, who actually takes care of signing off on those requests, who's responsible for the effects the AI has, and um, who actually takes charge of what is out there. So again, I can highly recommend the ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI from the high-level expert group. Um, they have a really good material out there. And the learning that uh, can be taken out of this is basically feature or bias, you need to assess the home project. So as you have seen in the uh, parts of the high level expert group, it is really like a whole project perspective in looking at basically everything the, the project does, all different uh, dimensions of it. And then after only this assessment, you can say this is a legitimate feature that an AI makes a decision on or this is actually a negative bias that I actually want to get rid of, or I, that I explicitly want to disregard in the analysis that the algorithm does. Good, four learnings down, one to go. <clears throat> so very often we're, as the venture, we're in a position where we actually uh, work with other companies and we're very often faced with the question, how much of my AI project can I actually outsource? And uh, we actually see, have seen really good reasons why AI projects are destined to be actually outsourced. Because one, very often an experienced in-house data science team does not exist. So a whole team where you can double check, where you can bounce off ideas, uh, there's a lot of companies where there's a single data scientist maybe already there, but the team actually makes a benefit. So in the bigger companies, we normally have, uh, if you remember in the previous slides, our um, project owner might be a data scientist and we're working with our team, with their data scientists together. Um, there's been some amazing collaborations going on between in-house data scientists and external but we still see that very often data science as a team or as a resource doesn't exist in those companies. If there is an existing uh, team, then it might be blocked with other projects. So this is the classical IT bottleneck where a data scientist is hired and they do amazing stuff, but they're heads over toe with, uh, full with projects. And if you actually want to do an additional innovation project, they barely have capacity to actually go through new things and, and, and explore that. Very good point. Very often it helps looking at it from a fresh perspective, to look at data from an outside perspective, um, to develop an out of the box view on what you actually have and not be trapped by your internal thinking and by traditions that data always has to look at a certain way in the company. So 
this we have already seen that getting an outside fresh perspective is something incredibly valuable. And uh, that is actually something that uh, we have made like really good experiences with uh, providing this outside perspective. Get the value of data patterns, features outside of your core business. This is a little bit tight, but very often someone who looks fresh at data, looks fresh at patterns, looks fresh at features says, wait a second, I think there is some additional upside here that is actually not your core business, but could be a very interesting perspective for some business development and spreading out with the actual data that you have. <clears throat> so obviously if you are in a company, you always focus on the core company uh, value creation and getting someone from the outside in gives you the opportunity to say, hey, wait, Maybe there is something interesting here that we have never ever considered in our core business. And there's some interesting perspective that uh, we should maybe further develop and could be potentially like on the long run, a spin out or uh, a different uh, kind of beast that creates actually value for the customer. And then last but not least, merely because you have the data science and you have found the results, it is still incredibly hard to execute uh, the innovation that you've found in the data. So data science plus innovation execution is really hard. And getting someone in who has a lot of experience in uh, executing innovation is a good idea to bring what you actually found onto the road and onto the customer. Lesson number five, outsourcing an AI project is possible and it can even be beneficial, uh, what we have seen in the last five years. So um, this is probably a, an, an exciting times uh, for, for everyone. Good, so those were uh, my, my, five, my five learnings. Um, I still have uh, a little bit of, of, of things that I can give. So here's one thing that we've been actively promoting over the last couple of weeks actually. And this is our tech flash. So, um, if you have an idea, if you have a project, doesn't matter if startup or corporate, and you say, hey, I want to talk to the guys at the Venture, uh, can you guys take an hour and walk with me through my idea, assess it, give some input, maybe already start like brainstorming how to best execute it. Then we're currently offering uh, a free tech flash um, where you can basically get in touch with us. And if we select your project, we'll sit down with you for an hour and give you all the insights how to start, what we think about the project. <clears throat> if it's actually a good idea, uh, what our experience with previous projects were. So I think this is really an amazing birthday present to all our partners and new friends that we haven't met yet to actually get in touch with us and uh, get some insights from us. And I'm really happy to give back to the community here. Uh, I already had a couple of those uh, tech flashes. They were really amazing. So if you're interested in, if you have an idea, if you're brainstorming something on a really high level, get a tech flash and uh, let's talk. This was it from my side. Uh, again, my name is Jacob. Uh, and if you wanna connect, please write me an email, connect with me on Twitter, 